in the big bill stack. We'll keep you in the know. In the big bill stack. We'll fix your techie woes. And we'll break things and we'll make these till we're all together raking. And we'll raise a cup of grog down in the big bill stack. In the big bill stack. Come and join our pirate crew. In the big bill stack. We will show you what to do. And we'll hack it till we crack it. And we'll tell the world about it. And forget to tidy up. That's why it's now a bilge tank. Hello and welcome to episode 001 of the Bilge Tank from Sheffield on Sea. Today we're going to talk about hats which are add-on boards for the Raspberry Pi. So we'll start by discussing what a hat is uh, and then we'll show you some hats that are available. Do you want to introduce us John? Or do you want to let the cards do that? Do the cards. You know? The cards are there. The cards are you there. can see. Yeah. We've, got, we've got Phil, we've got me, we've got Paul. Okay, good. We've got fine hats. Glad to turn that up. <laughs> hats um, going for hats. So in July last year, when the Raspberry Pi Foundation released the B+, and A+, they uh, introduced a new specification for add-on boards uh, called HATS, which stands for Hardware Attached on Top. Uh, and boards that meet that specification basically have to be a specific size and shape. They need to have a, a memory chip, which uh, lets the Raspberry Pi identify the board and set it up properly. Um, beyond that, they're pretty much whatever you can fit in the, uh, in the space. And obviously we've been very keen on the, the hat format. It gives us a really easy way to provide recognizable add-ons that you know will work with the Pi. Um, and we're going to take you through a few of the, the options that we've got here. And if you've got any questions, ask us on the YouTube or tweet us with hashtag bilgetank. And we can see that on our screen up here as well. Cool. So I think the thing is, there's now over 6 million Pis out there, which means there is a lot of people coming in to using Pies and using physical hardware who don't know very much and need an easy way to get started. And I think that's where the hat shines. That's where the hat just says, here's your Pi, plonk, now it's something else. Um, we're not quite there yet. There's still a little gap where we need to install the software and stuff. Yeah. And hopefully that's going to be patched by making use of this memory chip, this EEPROM. Well, I believe, I think the new Sense hat from the foundation does use the... You prom stuff, doesn't it? It seems to magically set up a frame buffer device, so as soon as you fire up your Pi with sense hat on top, you'll get a frame buffer that outputs to the little display. So you can just fire random characters at that and get a little picture. So we think that's been the first kind of concrete use of the EEPROM to automatically make the Pi play nicely with new hardware. And yeah, that's something we'd like to see more of, because at the moment, when you install one of our hats, you need to run this kind of command where you very naughtily download a script from the internet <laughs> and it installs the software. Yeah, yeah. Which is has nothing to do with that. It's, it's, it warns you that it's not the way things should be done. The, there's actually a website dedicated to naming and shaming those scripts. Unfortunately, we're not we on, on it yet. We should be on yeah, that we website. On that. Can, we, can we email them? <laughs> yeah. Hi, name and shame us, please. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we're going to take you on a tour through the hats we kind of stock in the shop um, and just explain a bit about what they do and how they turn your pie into something else. And if you've got specific questions, we'll answer those. I think that's an interesting thing about hats, is that they tend to be designed almost with a single purpose in mind. Slightly oddly, the specification only allows a single hat and a pie, so you can't, strictly speaking, stack them. Um, but it doesn't really work anyway, does it? It, it doesn't make a huge no. amount of sense. How, how many could you realistically stack anyway? Um, it looks very silly. What you do get is a lot of kind of really great little single-serving kind of features that you can I add to a right Raspberry Pi. I should plug my website, which does in fact... Uh, are we talking the pinouts? Pinout website, yeah. Which pins a particular hat does use. So if you are mad enough to want to stack them or you use multiple hats in conjunction, then you can figure out which pins are going to conflict, which pins aren't, and hopefully get more than one working at a time. Yeah, if you search for pinout uh, gadgetoid on Google, that will basically be the first result. But it's dead handy because it shows you the full pinout of a, like a B plus or a Pi 2. And then in the top right hand corner, there's a drop down menu. And if you pick a product out of the menu, it'll highlight the pins that it uses and gives you a bit of information about what it's doing. Yeah, so that's all awesome. Right, where should we start? I don't know. Should we start with DAX? We've got a couple of DAX. Okay, we'll start with the DAX. So uh, at the third birthday party, we finally got to meet a guy named Gordon. He was uh, very friendly and he makes these digital audio hats. Do you want to stick that on the other camera? Stick that on the other camera, let's get a bit of a close-up of that. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Please hold. Yep. Caller. Yeah, we totally mm, There we go. go. So, there it is, that's the Pi DAC hat. And what this does is DAC, Digital Audio Converter. It takes digital audio data at really high bit rates from your Pi. 
I think it goes up to 192 kilobits, does it? Yeah, I think it's yeah. similar to the performance of the DAC that's on the Slice, which was 192 kilobit DAC. Yeah. And and yeah. then it gives you some really nicely balanced audio ports on that <coughs> that you can plug into your home theatre or your speakers or your, you know, like your £2,000 high-end audio gear. And usually people have been paying kind of three, 400 quid or more for systems that will play back really nice low-noise audio. Um, and this, uh, this with a Pi does it for a fraction of that cost. And all the audio files we see are saying, yeah, this is, this is just so so noiseless and clean and beautiful and that's what the Pi deck does it's there to turn the audio from digital into analog and just do it really nicely and cleanly uh, the DAC, yeah. DACs are specifically quite important to get decent audio out of the Pi because the the actual audio port on the Pi uses a kind of slightly cheap and nasty technique of just driving PWM data at a very very basic filter to get the output um, this actually gives you proper high quality audio output from a Raspberry Pi yeah, you can get that out of the HDMI, <laughs> but kind of breaking that out is often a bit of a yeah. art in and of itself. I think you can get splitters, on, yeah. um, but you might as well stick a hat on the pie. So. But when you're listening to, you know, Mozart's Third Concerto. Mm -hmm. Did Mozart make Third Concertos? I don't know. Um, yeah, that's what you want. Then we've also got this new one, which is... Bigger and badder. Yeah. The DigiAmp. Oh, we're on that camera, Phil. Yeah, Nailed it's it. on the live screen now. <laughs> it's right there. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is the same thing. It's got that same digital audio converter, uh, which takes the, yeah. the digital signal, turns it into an analog signal. It then also has an amplifier on it. 20 watts per channel for 40 watts of booming output, which is really quite a lot, especially for something this small. And if you look at the little green terminals there, you can screw your speakers into there. And we've had some big kind of big... Kind of woofers about yay big. G's got those hooked up. The kind of things you normally play guitar through for some decent amplification. Yeah, yeah. Hook those up to that and they uh, they boom quite nicely. So it's a beast of an amp, which means it's got this uh, barrel jack on it, which you need like a 60 watt power supply to give it all the juice it needs to make that go boom, boom, boom. And just you can you can run it lower, right, with a smaller power supply. Yeah, we should it's totally just try if you're that. really pushing it. it it's will on my to do need list. a full size power supply. Yeah. Um, the important thing here is that obviously with the, the amp means it can be hooked straight up to speakers, so like you can connect straight up via you know decent speaker wire to, to whatever you want to listen through. Um, whereas the the other board has no built-in amplifier at all, so it just gives you like a line-out level signal that you can run into a decent amplifier. Um, so that's the that's the main difference between the two. They're not cheap boards, but they're really good quality boards, and well, people really rate them. Don't compared they? to what people were paying for DACs before, mm. they're, they're like a fraction of the price. In Pyland, they're not cheap but they're well worth it. So you can have this really high-end audio equipment, which is just one of these with a Pi, and we do an audio Pi by for it, and then you get yourself some nice speakers, and you've got this really high-end, clean audio system for yeah, yeah. not very much money. Um, my dad runs one of these at home. Though he runs the, the non-amplifier version, and yep. he has it in a Pi by audio, and then just running it into his amp at home, and that's what he uses. Is he like serious audio dude? He's not serious audio dude, but he's kind of semi-serious audio dude. Right. And he likes, you know, he likes opera and things like that. So he likes to hear, um, you know, he likes to hear good quality sound. So. Yeah. Sound if, stage. if you're looking for kind of an audio software distribution to work with this, Raspbian has basic stuff, but there are a couple of really good distributions called one's called Volumio, uh, that has a whole system for like streaming audio. You can get Spotify coming down into it, and just have a web interface to control it. So it's a bit like Kodi, but just for music. And the other one is Rune Audio. So if you look for either of those, they're good ways to control these and just, yeah, get your audio file on. Definitely. They're, okay. they're, they're good products. Check them out. Yeah. Oh, one uh, just one last thing to say. We've got a custom Pivo for these as well. Or is it? No, it's just for the DAC, right? Uh, just for the DAC. We'll have one for the uh, AMP at some point We're as well. We're working on that. Yeah. But yeah, there's a A plus sized and a Pi 2 sized version. Yep. In so kind of piano ways. black. Yeah. Um, and obviously that just sleek. It provides you with a lid that basically breaks the ports out nicely, so it's a bit more tidy. Mm -hmm. We should totally have demoed that. Well, next time. Yeah, next yeah. time. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's demo this. high quality audio over a YouTube stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't be the worst thing. We can give it a go. Okay. Mm -hmm. so James Mitchell asked, does this require any software hacking to get this to work uh, with Sonic Pilot likes, <laughs> or is it easy to select where the audio goes? I've no idea. Uh, <laughs> I believe with the device tree hacks, so these get detected 
with the new newer versions of Raspbian, and through Device Tree it loads up special drivers which uh, make it play a bit more nicely with things like Alsa Audio. So yeah, try that. That's a that's a good way to run those with software, or just use Volumio or use Rune Audio if you're looking for an audio setup. Yep. Yeah. And if yeah, obviously the other thing is that because this doesn't use the PWM hack, um, the PWM pin on the GPIO is still usable in principle. So you could drive. Uh, it might be great for doing like a NeoPixel Ambilight and yeah. high quality sound or something like that. I think Gordon got this and the Unicorn hat running. We should be able to. Yeah, there should yeah. be a problem. Like, even bigger power supply, right? Not stacked, but <laughs> no, yeah, no. Kind of separately. Jerry rigged, pulled the I think they right. shared a pin and he had to move the Unicorn hat hat output to another pin and then wire it up in a slightly funny way, but he did get yeah. them working together. Okay. Yeah. So all those hacks we've got rid of with hats, um, you can bring them back in to do oh, yeah. things, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, Absolutely, but this time they're officially supported hacks for hats. Yeah, yeah. 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 makes them better. It does. Mm. Hack hats. Okay, um, yeah. let's have a look at some of the Adafruit stuff. Yep. Um, Adafruit, very shortly after the hat spec was released, um, obviously kind of came out. A lot of this is kind of existing products, but just reimagined for the hat format. Um, so we'll route through pretty quickly. Um, they've done a, a really nice GPS module. This is the same module they use on their Ultimate GPS. Yep. Do you want to stick it on the other camera? Yep, let's Close stick up. it on the close-up. Woo! Close-up! Woo woo! Um, yeah, this is exactly the same module they use on the uh, Adafruit Ultimate GPS, which is a massively popular board. They've sold like tens of thousands of that board. It's really ridiculous. I think one of the features that people liked the most about this is it's got 10 hertz upright. Yeah, it's got pretty fast upright. It's, it's got as fast an update as makes sense. Uh, because if you go too fast with GPS, then it just interpolates the data or it doesn't really do it. Um, so if you see here, this has got the GPS and it's got something that Adafruit do on most of their hats, which is this um, breadboarding area. They have like a prototyping area. So if you want to turn your hat into a permanent project, you can just kind of use this area over here to solder a few more components on it, whatever that might be accelerometer, something like that. Um, that tends to be common to most of their hats at the moment. Yeah, um, they've definitely gone down that route, haven't they? Yeah, Where you can they see can it's, it. yeah. it's very much a philosophical thing with Adafruit, um, in contrast to our just all singing, all dancing, single purpose We style. are changing a little bit with that, as yeah. we'll see with the Displayatron hat, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah, just do a quick... Yeah, Extreme close-up! Press type all the things. Oh, yeah. That's a typing space. Mm-hmm. We love it, it's brilliant. Yep. The other thing about the GPS um, hat is that, I mean, the ceramic antenna is surprisingly good for, for a, you know, a small ceramic antenna. We've used it indoors before pretty effectively. Yep. Um, but it does have an external antenna uh, connection and uh, the coin cell, I presume it's for the real-time clock. Uh, the coin cell's sure. just, no, for oh, it to keep the... Warm start. Right, warm start. So with the GPS, when a GPS switches off and we switch it back on and it's been kind of completely lost its memory, it takes anywhere between 5 and 15 minutes, maybe longer, for it to find where the satellites in space are. Um, and that's, it's using relativistic principles to actually work out how long the radio signal, which is basically light end of the spectrum, how long it took to travel from space. And it's using that to work out, triangulate its position on Earth. And it's all really clever stuff, GPS. Unfortunately, the signal is below the noise floor. So to find the signal is really hard. So GPS is take you know this 10 to 15 minutes when they start up to find the satellites again with the battery in it can remember where the satellites were when it got switched off and when it's switched on it can kind of work out how far they've traveled and it's a bit quicker oh it can basically kind of interpolate from the last time it looked it can say yeah. oh you're going to be roughly here yeah and lock on a lot they were approximately here so they should be about here now cool. and it takes it a minute so that's what the little battery is for uh, another thing people use these for is setting up kind of pretty accurate clocks as well yeah. they use it just as a time thing because it doesn't need a radio signal it doesn't need the internet and part and parcel of GPS is a really accurate time signal. Um, it's yeah, part, part of the, the pulse, the, the signal that basically syncs you to the G GPS satellites includes time signatures, right? So you can and yeah. you can determine the distance and do offsets from that, and they have extremely accurate yeah. clocks. And then um, there's all kind yeah. of other stuff going on. And yeah, it works, and you end up with a clock. Yeah, yeah. It's, so a, GPS, it's a glorified clock. Yeah, you can also mm -hmm. use it for positioning if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what's next? What's next? Uh, so from Adafruit, we also have. Uh, this is their RGB matrix um, driver board. So this is basically those big display panels you see in like uh, like Times Square and stuff. They're always made out of uh, lots of independent modules. Tend to be like 32 by 32, 16 by 16. Yeah. This is basically a driver for those modules. So obviously we've got Unicorn Hat, which is kind of 
wicked 8x8 full RGB um, LED matrix. If you want something bigger, um, this is the ideal hat to drive it. So you still need to source the panel, and we should get some yeah. of those in, really. We haven't yet yeah, we've been looking for them. We just need to kind of stop doing stuff and get them at some <laughs> yeah. point. Actually get yeah. around to it. Um, mm. But again, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a nice board. Um, it gives you, because you can daisy chain those panels for obvious reasons, so it lets you make for, you know, not silly money, you can make quite big LED displays and drive them from up high. And those, for, for the amount of LEDs in them and their RGB, they're really, really quite cheap because they get used by the millions in signs around the world. Yeah, you might be talking kind of twenty pounds, thirty dollars, or something for a thirty-two by thirty-two panel. I think, uh, oh, maybe sixteen by sixteen, and you can get them in different pitches. So like yeah. a, a five millimeter, six millimeter, four millimeter, depending on what you want to do with it. Yeah, so, that's kind of cool. I don't think they've actually got a non hat version of this. So I'm not aware of one anyway. Uh, maybe I don't know. Stolen them over here. Oh, it feels got them all. Yeah. Right, and then we've got a couple of motor drivers. Uh, obviously, everyone likes motor drivers. We've got the servo hat and a DC motor stroke step stepper motor driver. Um, these are based on existing Adafruit products, so they're just kind of hat eyed versions of them, which is, yeah, it's handy to have. Yeah, so that's the motor driver, isn't it? You've got there, Phil. Big, chunky screw terminals. So uh, yeah, that's the DC oh, stroke yeah. stepper motor driver. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the other one, which is the servo driver, which, how many ta channels has that got? It's 12, I believe. 12 channels. Yeah. And I think, oh, is it 16? No, it's 16. Oh, cool. It's based on that Texas Instruments. Oh, no, it's not, yeah. actually. Zero no, it's not. It's 16 channels. Server 16 channels. Nice. So that's not quite enough for a kind of fully articulated hexabot, but that's, that's a lot of servos, and you'll need, again, common with these kind of big driver things is they need an external power supply really if you're going to drive a lot of stuff. Yeah. Motors take a lot of driving and they just have yeah. these huge spikes of current. Yeah, they're very noisy as well, so a well-designed kind of breakout board kind of saves you from a lot of pain, doesn't it? It's, um, yeah. they're, they're, they're not the easiest things to work with. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're nice boards. They're but these make it pretty easy, yeah. I think this is an interesting kind of example of kind of where we differ a bit in our approach to Adafruit, because uh, like, we love the stuff they do, but this is like this is quite a serious piece of kit. Isn't it? You know, sixteen. Well, it's, I guess it's it's not so much that it's big boy, but like um, the closest thing we do is the Explorer hat, and we I guess try to blend a few different features, so kind of like everything you might want to do to do a basic robotics project. Whereas this is very much single serving, tons of servos, it's kind of that's all that you do with it. Yeah. Um, but, but they used to have been serving do. hackers for years now. The, yeah, it's, it's they're, they're coming up to like they'll it? be uh, they'll be. Have gone, been going for like a decade soon, haven't they? I think they are 10 years already, yeah. I think it was right. this year, wasn't it? It's yeah, I think it's next year. They, they're like running for a decade. So they, they hackers know them, hackers love them, hackers go there for this kind of stuff. Whereas we, we're kind of, we kind of came out the whole Raspberry Pi thing, so we're trying to help new people get on board. Saying which, should we take a look at some of our fine hats? Yes, we could do. Let's yeah. do that. Come on, Phil, you can jump in with the oh, camera I've got hats. a um, propeller hat set up. Which oh, okay. incidentally yeah. will drive. Right. Just Let's take a look at a propeller hat. Talk about propeller a little bit, yeah. Phil, because it's a bit of a, an, it's, it's an interesting one. It's a curious one. So basically the guys behind the um, propeller chip are called Parallax Inc. And they kind of started the hobby electronics maker movement mm. with the basic stamp back in, I think it was 1996. So way, way, way back in 1996, these guys came up with the idea of having a little microcontroller that the average guy could buy and start hacking around with. And it worked pretty well up until Arduino, of course, in 2006, I think. Just came along, rained on their parade and kind of took over the market. relegated them to secure, uh, obscurity and took over the market. But Parallax were not beaten. Um, they came out with the propeller chip, or in fact, the one engineer at Parallax... Um, Chip Gracie, who is a genius wizard, uh, basically went into his bedroom and came out with a design for an 8-core microcontroller, which is basically like having 8 Arduinos stuck together in one package, which um, if you kind of think about how the Arduino works and how it can effectively only do one thing at any one time, having 8 microcontrollers doing 8 things simultaneously is um, extremely powerful and extremely useful. So. Yeah, these are like completely independent cores. Yeah, um, and there's a kind of a round robin system to negotiate indeed, between it's, them. It's got a structure where there's a hub that actually dispatches um, code to each of the cores. Um, so in theory, you can actually have the hub dynamically rewrite the code that's on any given core to give it a different <laughs> task. But only crazy wizard geniuses actually bother doing that. For the most part, you'll set a, a 
core off <coughs> to do a task and it'll do that task and that'll be all it ever does. But mm -hmm. yeah. um, and any one of those eight cores can control any one of the 32 I.O. pins as well, which is... Um, it's got its own language for this, hasn't it, as well? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, you've got a tutorial up on the learning oh, yeah, portal. Yeah. We've oh, got yeah. uh, quite a number of tutorials, in fact, on the learning portal, specifically covering the spin language for uh, propeller and actually the propeller assembly language because mm -hmm. it's just so far removed from everything else. So it's, it's got some similarities with um, Python in that it uses kind of white space or structure and doesn't have overly sugary syntax. Um, but it's, it's alien to a lot of people. So we've got some tutorials that cover kind of basic Blink examples in uh, Spin, which is the kind of normal sane language for programming the propeller, and in PASM, which is propeller assembly which is quite rewarding to actually think around with, but it's a little bit more advanced um, and it requires a, a kind of bit more of a, a mental leap to get started with. I think like two things that are really interesting about the Prella are the number of IOs, 32, but there are no real IO peripherals. So you get no like hardware SPI, no yeah, light squared C, no analog channels. Yeah, design goals, basically. Yeah, so it's very raw. You didn't need anything specific in hardware in order to actually uh, cover off that, that hardware or tech that hardware checkbox and a good example of that is actually on Flotilla mm -hmm. where we've gone we're not going to use the hardware I2C we're going to connect buses up to every pin on the microcontroller and run eight separate I2C buses because that's something you might do in a microcontroller and that's kind of what the propeller chip has decided to, or what the design goal for the propeller chip was is don't put an analog chip on there because there are good analog chips you can buy off the shelf if you want one don't put I2C on there because you can emulate it in software and you've got a whole core to dedicate to the process and the same with any other peripheral you might normally have on a microcontroller. Something you get back, for, I guess, is kind of a compromise from, for that loss of flexibility is um, the chip runs pretty fast. It's like 96 mm. megahertz or something. This so. one is clocked at 96. I think the normal clock is on a 5 megahertz crystal, which runs the propeller at 80 megahertz. Mm -hmm. well, we've stuck a 6 megahertz one on there, which, if my math is correct, runs it at 96. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because overclocking. It's, it's rated, <coughs> it's been tested for somewhere up to 100 megahertz officially and, and had some pretty harsh testing in the factory. So. Uh, we know Parallax uh, don't sell them at that speed, but they'll say they work up to that speed. Yep. The other great thing about this is as well, after designing this chip and then designing this language for this chip, they then went to open source the whole thing, didn't they? <laughs> they did, indeed. This is one of the, the strangest things. Very recently, I think it was last year at some point, mm -hmm. maybe early this year, they basically released the VHDL, which is a, a, like a programming language that describes hardware. Uh, so they released all of the hardware descriptions onto the internet and allowed people to actually run a copy of this chip effectively in their field programmable gate arrays, which are magical chips that basically can be dynamically reconfigured to, to so simulate like chameleon chips, become, aren't they? You can, turn them, into you can turn them into more or less any hardware by dynamically reconnecting them. It's and these days, cool. FPGAs, you see inside <coughs> oscilloscopes, you see them inside HDMI capture cards and things, video capture cards, just because they can do things very parallel and they can be updated. I think the important mm. thing with them is if you have volume, but you don't have quite enough volume to get your own chip manufactured, then you can just buy a load of FPGAs and make them into the chip you want with only software. It'll be expensive, but to, you don't have massive It'll be expensive, but it will be massively, yeah. massively expensive, and you can just yeah. pass that price on to your customer if you're making an oscilloscope. That's fine. I yeah. think um, the Pell Hat, like if you've been playing with Arduino for quite a while, or Raspberry Pi for quite a while, and you fancy a really different challenge because it's a whole new mindset on, on how a microcontroller should work or operate and you know the platform itself um, the propellers are a really good choice to have a look at um, it's just so different it, like, it, it takes a while to get used to it yep anyway we open sourced our design for this as well so if somebody else wanted to go and make something as crazy as the propeller hat they could go out <laughs> and they could make a propeller hardware. hat open source hardware yeah Ooh. And they could make their own PCB, and then they could go and get a chip fab to go and make the propeller chip on the back there. And, you know, it's open source hardware down to the atoms. So yeah. since, they were, since they were good about that, we just followed suit and did it as well. Yeah, it felt right, didn't it? Yeah. So um, I've actually got this set up with what is hopefully um, a simulator of a Commodore 64 SID chip. And we had this at a couple of make fairs and stuff and drove everyone absolutely crazy. No, people love this. It's a music. great demo. Yeah. Um, and with any luck, it'll actually work, but it probably will go horribly, horribly wrong because live demos, not even once. Got so the green lights are a good sign. So I want to hit enter and see if any music comes out. If it's definitely loud, sorry, but here we go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Can't hear it, Phil. 
Can't hear it, Phil. Not a thing. Not a thing. <laughs> Switch the speaker off and on. The speaker often crashes. Oh, no. This is really? like yeah. Wow. This the cheapest is... Chinese Bluetooth speaker, <laughs> and sometimes they actually crash. Nice. I think my SID file is just complete rubbish. Okay. Either that or I'm connected up to the wrong pin. But <laughs> go on. Let's watch Phil live hacking. <laughs> live hacking. Let's live have hacking. a look. Let's have Phil a look. Phil Howard. Possibly be going wrong. In the with tank. Ooh. from Sheffield. There was a the there was a note. Something came out of that. I don't even know what that was. Who even knows? It's probably more likely actually that there's a serial terminal right Okay, we've got no pilot. lights now, Phil. No lights. Ah. Improved it to have no light. No! No! It's dead. Okay, while Phil does that, <laughs> should we talk about another hat? Yeah, uh, let's talk about unicorn hats. Okay, unicorn, unicorn hat. hat one? Yeah. Unicorn hat there. This <coughs> is just something. This is. Was this our first hat? This is our very first yeah. hat. Yeah. We saw the hat spec and we said. Yeah, there's How not really LEDs going to fit on it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we, we filled it to the gills. We kind of had to go for this surface mount header on the back of it to make it work at all. And then we got this to pretty much a square grid of 8x8 near pixels. Sorry, WS2812. Bees. Sorry, yeah. sorry Limor. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, trademark. Um, yeah, so that was our test card. And it works pretty well, and it's bright. Um, one week we might actually try frying an egg on that when it's at full brightness, just to prove it can be done. Because we think it gets warm enough. Uh, yeah, if you put all of the LEDs on at full brightness, it, it yeah, it yeah. will draw like 1.2 amps or so. It's yeah, just within the threshold of what the pie can give it. So if you look here, this we've got this running on the camera two here. There you go. Uh, what's this code here doing here, John? We show this in the demos all the time, and this is an example code. Um, you explain shaders. Yeah, basically, basically for this, I wanted to create some nice effects that we could show off at um, events like Make Affairs or whatever. So I wrote uh, a very small kind of uh, wrapper program that essentially runs shaders. Uh, and what a shader is, is a, is a function that gets called essentially with an X, Y, and a time step. So for every pixel on the display, for every frame, it calls the same function, passing those three parameters in. And the function just manipulates that information to produce some sort of output. So you might you might pass like the x and y into a sine wave, and you'll get like a blobby style effect. Um, and then I just wrote a few shaders for it, which are they're kind of fun demos because it's something that attracts people to it. They can see kind of interesting things going on. Yeah. But we see people doing kind of really cool stuff with Unicorn Hat, especially yeah. as like uh, indicator style stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, server server load graphs. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just a nice thing, really. But those shaders, that's the same kind of approach that 3D cards are doing, right? That's basically like how a GPU would process a frame of uh, image, yeah. It's, yeah. it's that kind of Because they, they've always mystified me. Well, it's... You showed me that link just to kind of the <laughs> annotated ray tracer, and then I ended up going to shadertoy.com. Oh, shadertoy's awesome. Oh, I love really shadertoy. Yeah, if you ever want to look at what people do with shaders, go to shadertoy.com and listen to your graphics card howl. It's, really <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, good afternoon watching that happen. The key thing about why shaders operate like this is that the function is stateless. So you give it an X, Y, and a step, uh, like a frame counter number or whatever, but the function has no other information. It can't know anything else about the state of the program, basically. Well, that's not entirely true. You can have, like, textures or whatever passed in, but what that means is that, in principle, you can call that function 64 times simultaneously for each pixel on the unicorn hat. You don't have to call it once and then do the next pixel and then do the next pixel. If you have a 64 core processor, you can give one of, uh, each of the processors one pixel to deal with. And because it's stateless, those functions can basically function, return all their data simultaneously, and the display can just update. So it's just a, it's a nice way to do that kind of thing, basically. Yeah. And this is kind of what some people have done with the GPU on the Raspberry Pi. They've I don't done, know. They... They've been doing compute style stuff with it. Yeah, the fast Fourier transform stuff. Right. So the way to turn sound into kind of these are the frequencies inside the sound. Whoa! Step back. I don't think that's There's a new quite player right. in town. <laughs> Phil, it did something. It's sounding. That does not sound like my old set chip. Oh! Why does it sound funny? I have no idea. Is it speed? <laughs> Yeah, you get the idea. This basically can emulate the, the SID oh, chip from a I... Commodore 64. With, is it basically I'm, I'm, perfectly accurate? I'm trying to play a SID dump, okay, which yeah. is um, a SID file is basically a Commodore 64 application that contains all of the instructions that the Commodore 64 processor understands. Those instructions then generate audio by running as programming instructions and hitting the audio chip with the relevant data. Um, if I try and stream one directly to this, this can't understand the um, individual bytecode of the actual Commodore processor instructions, so it just 
goes horribly wrong and sounds a bit like this. So. Uh, in fact, it's died now. <laughs> wow. So, um, yeah. yeah, in order to actually make that play, you first need to take the SID file and dump the... Oh, you have to uh, transform have to that. So transform now. it right, into okay. a raw dump of the registers that are said, sent to the SID chip. So it's almost like a disassembler to yeah. produce like, raw Unfortunately, data. Unfortunately, I have not done that step, therefore I cannot play the dump. Bad Phil. Mm. Bad Phil. Okay, um, but as Phil said, on the learning portal we've got um, quite a few tutorials about using the propeller hat, so go and have a look at that and yeah, see if it looks interesting. It's a very, it's a, it's a very cool chip. Okay, um, next up, uh, Skywriter, because I know we've asked a question about that. Oh, unicorn hat, are we done with that one? We're done with unicorn this hat, is, yeah. This is our most popular hat by far, it's, you know, it's, it's awesome, people love it. Um, Blinky lights. Also, like, we're really specific about things, so we made sure those pixels were bang on square, not like... Some LED matrices out there. Just saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, next up is Skywriter. Uh, this is kind of interesting. It's based on a microchip part called the MGC3130, which is um, it's a near field gesturing um, solution. So basically, <laughs> this is a really basic uh, device, but there's only one chip on the back and you know, some b basic decoupling. Um, but essentially, that chip does some pretty clever stuff. Uh, and can take, I don't know if you can see kind of some texture, there you go, on the electrodes. It can basically detect the position of objects, kind of obscuring a field that is generated by those electrodes, uh, reports it back to the chip, and then the chip can give the information back to the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's a, it is a nice chip. I think it was a company who were bought by Microchip who developed this. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it was like a Microchip in-house. It's a slightly weird chip to work with. It's got some nasty stuff. I think we basically talked to it via I2C, but it has like extra lines for locking whether you're allowed to start doing transfers. It has like a, a master clear line. So it's kind of like I2C plus some stuff and pretty ugly at the same time. So Phil basically fought with the software like a ninja the to get it. The biggest battle with this was actually getting um, uh, not necessarily open source, but a Python based or something we can run on the Pi to actually flash the software to it. Yeah, oh yeah, well, you have yeah. to do a calibration profile as well. So using like their closed source software, you place uh, foam blocks and copper tape and things on top of it in certain profiles <laughs> and settings, and you you kind of log that into the software and it adjusts the profile. Once you've made the profile for the board once, you can then, in theory, just load that into as many chips as you like. But we want to do it from a Pi. All our programming jigs are based on Pis. So Phil had to reverse engineer their protocol for actually flashing the chip so that we could take the, uh, the kind of profile data and flash it ourselves from our own test jigs. Yeah, it was moderately entertaining. You took about three runs of that software over the space of six months or something, didn't you? Something like. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't that pleasant but to But it work works with. really well now. Uh, it does there's work. videos of kind of uh, Monkey Made Me, James and Les using it for presentations where they do the Jedi mind trick over it to change their slides. So they'll go, next slide. Like mm -hmm. that. Oh yeah, yeah. James, uh, James Mitchell, at Raspberry Jam Berlin. Yep. Yeah, Raspberry Jam Berlin. He kind of uses it as a like a presentation tool. So gesture, slide next, gesture, slide back. Yeah. Um, nice. You can use it as a like a mouse control. So basically, what this once all the craziness goes through Phil's kind of software drivers, what you get back in your Python library is an X Y Z position of, of a finger or whatever. So where you are, a little you. box over the top of it. Yeah, and I think I mean that works. We do a larger version of this that isn't a hat. Um, the smaller one has less range, just because of the way that the electrodes are laid out. Uh, it works up to about 10 centimetres or so. But yeah, in principle you get a, a position of the finger hovering above the board, um, which is pretty cool. So you can use it for kind of like basic mouse movement and things like that, game controlling. Uh, we do a demo with it as a theremin, so it's kind of like woo, 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 which is really annoying. Like, yeah. it's, it's more <laughs> annoying than the propeller, I'll be honest. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a nice thing. It's kind of unique, and that's, I guess, what makes it worth fighting with to uh, to get to this stage. Um, yeah, it's a nice thing. Cool. So, piano hat. I will, piano I will hat. attempt this one more time. <laughs> oh, then I'm going to put piano Phil's, hat on. So we're watching again. Phil. Drum roll, please. Stop it! There we How go. awesome is that? Cool. It sounds absolutely great as well. It's such a such a kind of genuine uh, right, yeah. Commodore experience. Mm. So anyway, that was great. We're moving on. To now the we can thing. jimmy that yeah. off and get a piano hat in its place. Yeah. Press See, look at this. This is theoretically how it works. We just turn one. We turn a pie into another thing just by swapping the hat over like that. How awesome! That's the idea. Hopefully, the software will run now. Yeah. 
Uh, we actually need to plug the speaker in as well. Uh, which is over here. Yep. And I'll need to tell it to use the speaker. Yeah. So John there just... <laughs> <laughs> we've got a thing where Nothing we're using happened. a Canon camera for our close-up camera. <laughs> and every half hour it switches off because EU regulations. So that was just the... <laughs> yeah, hitting the half hour mark for the show. Bang. Anyway, piano oh, hat. We've been running for a while then, haven't we? Yeah. Okay, so... So, Zach made this as a Indiegogo campaign, didn't he? Indeed, yeah. So, yeah, yeah Zachary Eagleman. Eagleman? Eagleman? Eagle Eagleman. Something like that. Eagle um, Man sounds good. Eagle That's Man. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, he created uh, Pi Piano, which yep. is basically an octave of a piano plus an additional note. So you've got your C to your C. Um, on a board, I should have got Pi Piano for comparison, but it, it uses tack switches or tactile buttons and it uses one of the common IO expanders, the MCP23016. Oh, on his original like board, that. yeah, yeah it's, it's board. like the classic microchip one. Yeah. So, yeah, it will use. 13 of those as inputs for the keys and the other three as outputs for the three LEDs that are on it and it made a really nice little piano and it was a really 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 good idea one of those ones where you kind of face palm and go why didn't we do that think of that yeah why have we not um so yeah we got to hit our heads together with Zach and said we really want to do a pimeroniized version of this product um because we think it could be really cool and yeah, I think behold. Zach didn't want to spend the next year <laughs> <No>. <coughs> learning how to do a hardware startup no. to produce lots more of them. Yeah, no. which you know, he's got things to do. He's he's got studies. I think he's out there being very clever right now. Um, yeah, so we kind of gave it the Pimeroni spin, gave it a nice design, Pimeroni turned it into Cap Touch, and yeah. Well, let's just put lots of lots of obscure jokes about piano manufacturers on it. It's <laughs> yeah. gold. Very much so. Yeah. Oh, it looks so good. From Buizadov. It is mostly Paul's work making this look so good. But I did draw the key outlines in, in Eagle. You did, Bill. You did some really <laughs> nice... Some key it's the way lines. it always works at Pimeroni. Just We all add our magic into the tub and That's at the end it comes terrible. awesome. Yeah. So, so we're really happy with this because it's got gold and white and black and it looks like a piano and it's shiny and it works. <laughs> Indeed. Switch to piano. Play, play something. Oh, well, we've got, we got yeah. piano. Yeah, switch Some, piano. Something out of copyright. <laughs> Not that filled, no. No, no, don't play. No. 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 La, 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 <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> Sorry, YouTube come hot down hard on copyright infringement. So the biggest challenge with actually making Piano Hat work, I mean, the idea is fairly... Um, simple in of itself. It uses two cap touch chips, which uh, we used the cap one one eight eight before on anything. I don't think we not have, on anything but else. We no use similar cap touch chips on other products, um, namely Explorer Hat, which has um, the cap touch buttons along the bottom and the left hand side. So it uses two of those cap touch chips in tandem to give it. Each has eight uh, channels, and that gives it sixteen channels, which is enough for the thirteen keys along the bottom, incidentally, and the three buttons on the right, which are instrument octave up and octave down. Uh, it also has sixteen LED drivers, so in true Pimeroni fashion, we absolutely covered it with LEDs, <laughs> <laughs> which is great because they're actually quite useful for doing things like teaching people to play the piano. You light up the LED, people press a corresponding key, or whatever else you can you can kind of imagine to do with them. They will yep. use shiny little Larson scanning effects and all manner of things. And the cap touch chips actually handle driving the LEDs uh, completely. So they have weird fade patterns and all sorts of random stuff in that you can play with. That's quite common because obviously cap touch chips are often used for making like um, touch based interfaces and things and you quite often want LED indicators as well. So you know so, you've actually touched it. Yeah exactly, got it, either for feedback. feedback or to like highlight a key or something like that. So you'll often find a cap touch chip has as many LED drivers as it has touch inputs. Um, but they do have weird restrictions. Like you don't usually have full brightness control over them. They'll yeah, be like yeah. they'll trigger on the key press, or you can turn them on and off. Or it's not designed yeah. to be an LED driver. It's no. a cut down no. indication only. Uh, the nice. biggest challenge with this was that we're basically making cap touch buttons that are one third to one half the size they should really be. <laughs> so as you can tell when I play it, unless you're very skilled and you've had a bit of practice, and you can play it pretty damn well with a bit of practice you'll find that your finger will hit one or two keys at the same time quite easily. Yeah. And that's 
because these cap touch buttons should be about twice to three. Try with the stylus, yeah, Phil. Stylus. <coughs> wow. it. So you there can either go. use a stylus or sharpen your finger. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Or have smaller fingers, I mean. The yeah, that also works. Kids, mm, that pinky, piano. <laughs> pinky, pinky piano. Pinky piano. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's a really, uh, it's a really nice animation. board. Uh, the LEDs do add some more utility. Like Phil says, you can almost have like Guitar Hero style games where they light up and you're kind of uh, pressing the keys to follow what it's telling you to do. Um, and you can use it for other things. Like, yep, you know, okay. general input stuff. Well, you've you could put an overlay got on that. 16 buttons, so yeah, like yeah. I say, put an overlay and you've got 16 buttons to, as long as you don't mind accidentally mushing two at once, mm -hmm. then you've got 16 buttons to control your project, which is really quite useful. Is it possible to get the sensitivity on that so that it would detect through, say, uh, a layer you of acrylic? Can, yes, yeah. but as soon as you get to that kind of level of sensitivity, you, you raise the risk of pressing two buttons. But you might the, be able to, like, put the a. The cap touch driver. Inventors had a kind of solution to that problem is that you, you basically only allow one key to be triggered at any one time. Which we don't do with this because you want no, to call it a piano, you, you but you want to be able to do chords and stuff of that nature, otherwise it wouldn't really be a piano, it would be a, no. a monophonic synthesizer. But you can turn it into like a can, single touch mode yeah. and it'll only detect the, the, like the most prominent the most touch. Most likely yeah. touch, yeah. Okay, no, that's. that's it's very cool. It's very cool. And we've um, on Displaytron hat we use a similar captor ship in the same family, and we've dialed the, um, the the sensitivity up so far on that you can actually touch right through the lid. Of nice the segue, mode. Phil. Nice segue. Should we switch to camera two? Yep. <coughs> uh, yeah, probably the last thing we're looking. Well, almost last thing we're going to look today is the Displaytron hat, which is kind of a long time coming. We produced the Displaytron three thousand. Oh, when? When? I mean, it came out just before the B+. Plus. It was kind of like we released it and then it was like, oh, everything's changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is fine, you know, that's how technology is. But um, the Splatoon 3000 was popular. I think it was kind of unique because it had the, the RGB backlight, the multi-zone RGB backlight. Mm -hmm. um, from that, we spent a bit of time uh, later on kind of turning that into a hat format. The Splatoon 3000 had a little mini joystick on it. It was a little bit fiddly. Um, so we switched it out for cap touch. We got six cap touch buttons instead. Um, there's a little LED bar graph, which is quite nice for, say, monitoring CPU level or um, just you know notifications, alerts, whatever. And yep. we upgraded the backlight to be six zones, which is basically unique. Oh, we should have we should have had a demo set up for this because yeah. yeah, it's really um, it's quite special. I've never seen anything quite it's like just, that. It's <laughs> so slim as well. We we kind of we, we don't like the, the, the big we don't like the big sixteen by two displays. No, the industrial ones. Right? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're so common, they're so cheap, but they're so chunky. And when you've put them on top of a add-on board on top of the pie, you end Whoops. up with something that's like this thick. That's Whereas we want something nice that's and spelt and very pie-like. Yeah, the one Paul's talking about there, the, the HD44870 or something, they're yeah. like classic 16x2 industrial display. Yeah. But as he says, they're almost a centimetre thick, they're on a separate PCB, you then have to kind of connect that to something else. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of lame. The Displayatron LCD is two millimetres thick. And then obviously we raise it up a bit to put a diffuser underneath for the backlight, but you know it's super slim. Um, you talk to it in exactly the same way. I think it's I think the protocol is compatible with the HD four four seven eighty, and that includes I believe the four bit, the eight bit, the SPI, and the I squared C interfaces. However, this specific model doesn't have the I squared C pins out, but it does use the same driver chip. Um, and the other thing that's quite nice about this is sixteen by three display, so yep. you get like another line of information in there, which is pretty cool. Yep. So we've got top 3 k on that one, I think. Oh, that one. I'll switch yes. over. You're right. I'll give you that off. Let's see if can get it right. I think there was a there was a good thing on Twitter. I'm going to just have to put the tweet up. Let's find the tweets. What we got? Where can I view it later? On YouTube. Yeah. On our YouTube channel. As soon as we finish the show, YouTube start processing it. About an hour or so later, it pops up in our YouTube channel as a live stream. Boom. Yep. Uh, but if you check out at Monkey Made Me on Twitter. Uh, he retweeted a good project from Berlin. Uh, somebody had made a can crusher, and it showed oh, you yeah, how many yeah. cans have been crushed on the Displayatron just above the can crusher. Bam. So that was a really nice project. I'm just going to answer a question for Sandy first, uh, yep. who's just asked on the tweet. That one's He's saying, hat, what's the header on top of the Sense Hat for? It's actually the primary header for the Sense Hat. Um, the spec of... Ah, I can't pull it <laughs> off now. Basically, this is just a pin header stuck into it. There we go. So the... Um, it, it's basically a reverse entry header. So you can actually plug that straight onto a Pi as it is, and these pins are designed to be entered from a from a header from the underside of the board. Now, 
we've not gone down this route with our hats, and not many people have actually, mainly because these headers are stupid expensive. Um, but you can certainly install them on a Pi just like that, and it's a little bit slimmer, it's a little bit lower down. Um, the Sense hat does come with a like an extender, which is lucky because that means it works with things like the Coupe case, which would have lifted it up too high. And it's literally just plugging through, and that plugs onto the Pi itself. Okay. Question answered. <laughs> and now was. Was oh, that explained from the newer demo? Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's get that. Is. Let's do something that's actually got some kind of interface. Can we see the text Man, on Man, that's so bright. <laughs> it's too bright for the camera now. It's basically <laughs> glaring out the camera. Yeah. I've got a bit of diffuser material somewhere here. Where is it? Yeah. Where's, my, where's my clear diffuser? Clear diffuser is here. Aha. Uh -huh. There we go. Let's see. No, that's really not <laughs> helping. <laughs> it does <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Oh, uh, you see, it says such a rainbow. Um, Okay, and I think it's the one honest. thing that now those LEDs are just bright enough to make it really something quite disco and amazing. Yeah, and in, in person, those, the colours are actually very vibrant. Ooh, so this yeah. is like a bright cyan, but it's just washing the camera out a bit. Yeah. But here, Phil's made like a menu system, so you can go up and down the menus, uh, pick things. I think you can set the backlight colour, can't you? Stuff like that. Yeah. There you go. Red. <laughs> and because of the six zone backlight, it means you can kind of uh, obviously cross fade colours and things like that, which is kind of cool. Yep. Cool. I can, so, I can show that to time's running on. Time. Yeah, I think we've got one more hat that is our pride and joy, which is the Explorer hat. Oh yeah, we didn't even talk about Explorer hat. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we mentioned it roughly with the, um, with the motor stuff. The Explorer yeah. hat, I think, is like becoming probably our most popular hat. I think Unicorn hat is still probably the most popular, but yeah. this just gives you, it gives you so many different things that you can do all in one platform. And because you can only put a single hat in a pie, it gives you um, kind of, you know, it's not it's not like it's 16 channels of servo PWM or it's not really meaty motors, but it gives you like a good starting point for a lot of features. It's, it's like if you only buy one hat for your pie, we, we made sure that this is the one you want because bang for your buck, this is awesome. It's got the motor drivers, it's got analog inputs, it's got power drivers, Darlington array on there. It's got a little breadboard on top, so you can turn it into other things. It's got cap touch, it's got LEDs next to some of the cap touch buttons. For the camera? Oh, Phil's hands. Arms are now in the way. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, just, it's just got so much stuff just packed into one hat. Oh, you plug it in, cool. I live installed the software, so. Um, because of that, we've we've uh, we've made lots of demos for it. We've made lots of learning portal things for it. So this is kind of the hat we kind of want to want to be the one that people get introduced to play with, and just yeah. do things like they make games. You can make robots. We're going to make a robot chassis for this, so you can just turn your pie into so many things very easily. And if you want to get started with kind of electronics and physical computing and all that, the Explorer Hat Pro is the one. We, yeah. th we thought about the feature set for this for a long time because it was kind of like an idea for a product we wanted to make, but mm -hmm. it's kind of the hardest part about making any of the products we design, I guess, is kind of deciding what you're going to leave out almost. Yeah. Um, because you've got to get to a decent price point. It can't be stupidly expensive. It just it doesn't make sense. And um, obviously, every feature is like a, a cost-benefit analysis, essentially. You're kind of saying, is it worth 50p on the bomb for this thing? Or what if we throw this out? Well, what if we use this cap touch? We get the LED drivers for free. Great, let's do that. <laughs> um, and with Explorer Hat, I think, I think we kind of nailed it because... You know, you get four analog channels, which the Pi has none of. Very useful, great for things like light sensors, line following robots, all that kind of stuff. Um, Recap the position of analog servos and things like that as well, I guess. I don't know. It's well, you could if they have these, and yeah. There's all sorts of stuff that the you know the Pi has no analog, so this gets you into kind of the analog world with the Pi. So we thought that was critical. We then got five, uh, four inputs that are actually buffered. That just protects the GPIO and the Pi, so you can use them up to five volt input. Um, again, a lot of other stuff is five volt, you know, especially hobbyist stuff. And the Pi's GPIO being three v three, we made that decision that the Explorer hat would kind of bump everything up to five volts and give you a more familiar interface. Um, it also has four powered outputs. The Pi's GPIO can only give you about fifty milliamps, which is, you know, it's nothing basically. It's it's very very little power. Um, we just run four of the outputs through a Darlington array, and that's essentially like the switches for each of those channels. Uh, and that means you can draw like half an amp out of those ports. Um, with four of them, it's perfect for a stepper motor. So that's kind of useful. You can also drive DC motors off this, but only single direction. And then the very last feature was two H bridge motor drivers. And these are basically critical if you want to make any sort of robot or buggy. Um, 
uh, an H-bridge lets you drive a motor in two directions, so it actually reverses the voltage between the two pins. Um, there is basically no other way you can do that without some discrete circuitry and stuff, so we thought building it in would be a really nice feature. So from this, you can kind of build like buggies, you can build robots, you can build you know all sorts of projects, cat feeders, M&M sorters, like literally, you know, yeah. The, the idea was to do, be able to do as much as you possibly could. Just take away a lot of the friction of trying to hook up multiple things yeah. to Python or whatever. And give it like a, a, you know, a good fixed format, have the extra buffering for safety in the classroom, you know, so you don't yeah. damage your pipe. And we added kind of capacitive touch. So there's my capacitive touch banana. <laughs> Trigger. Boom. Boom. Um, and we've got croc lip pads down one side, so that's a bit like a makey-makey. You can do... Um, you know, like fruit pianos and that kind of thing. Yeah. We added another four cat touch along the front, just as standard inputs, so that you could um, build basic interfaces. And then the final, to top it off, we figured we could fit a breadboard on top of that. So we put a mini breadboard on top, um, and that means that you can actually build your project on top of the hat as well. So, yeah, we're really proud of the Explorer hat. It's it's yeah. it's a really nice product. We like that one. It's worth mentioning that Les Pounder says this is the one they currently use most at Pi Academy, and I think that's yeah. it's because it's so flexible and it has so many of the basics that there is kind of no better choice at the moment. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's, um, yeah, it gives you a lot of features for the, basically for the price, so it, yep. it's definitely a good start to one. And we do, a, we do a parts kit that goes with that, and we'll probably do more of this, actually. Yeah, um, but if you've got lots of cheap electronics there, like LEDs and things, you can plug them in here, yeah. pick them up for next to nothing. This, I mean, the, the whole point of the parts kit was really just so that we could do uh, material around it and you could know you could expect the user to have these things basically so if they bought the parts yeah. kit they'd be able to do all the stuff we do on our learning portal yeah. Yeah. like the temperature sensor minecraft thing yeah exactly yeah but it's all cool stuff yeah so right. right we've given you a tour of some good hats there i think it was a fairly effective plug all around wasn't it sort of glossed <laughs> over sense hat a little bit yeah but. Yeah, and the, obviously I this is the first, oh, yeah. the first official hat from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, which is the Sense hat. This is actually the the hat that's going into space as part of the Astro Pi project. Mm. It's actually a really nice board, even though I much maligned its um, slightly <laughs> skewed aspect ratio. Um, they they have managed to get a eight by eight RGB matrix on here as well. Um, they're actually using a, a, a driver chip for that rather than the kind of intelligent pixels, um, which is why you got like the eight row driver fets down the side. Um, it also has. Uh, kind of some, uh, what do you call it, like DOF stuff, degrees of freedom stuff with yeah. the accelerometer, Tilt gyroscope, yeah. magnetometer, magnetometer. magnetometers. Uh, it has pressure and humidity sensors. So it's, this one, again, this is another kind of good all rounder type this is projecty hat. You also, you know, all cool stuff. great value for money hat, because like right, Emma just said, yeah, we want a hat with some sensors on. Yeah. Which sensors do you want on there, Evan? And he said, all of them. And they did. Yeah. I noticed they've got a small joystick on there too, so I assume yeah. the version 2 of this will come with cat touch. Right, <laughs> totally. Yeah. But no, it's, it's, it's a nice hat, and that's or is that like £25, £24? Uh, it depends where you get it from, anywhere between yeah, 25 quid mark or a little bit less. It's good value um, for what's on there. Yeah, definitely. very much so. Definitely good projects there and good learning resources. And the, the frame buffer driver for the display is very cool. I like yeah. That. yeah, it is. Well, we, we need to sort that out with the unicorn hat, right? Still like the unicorn hat, <laughs> yeah, basically. Totally. We're having yeah. that. That's a good idea. Uh, finally, James Mitchell asks, will there be a Flotilla dock hat at some point? The very <sighs> first versions of Flotilla, like our, our in-house prototypes, were actually, they weren't hats, but they were GPIO add-on boards. Um, we went down the USB route for a couple of reasons. Um, one was it meant you could plug multiple docks in. So you can actually plug four docks into a single B+, which is kind of cool. Yep. Two was it meant we could talk over USB serial or serial. We, can't, we could have done that with a, a hat style board over the TXRX pins, but I don't know. The main reason we went away from it was that when you had the board connected to the Pi and you had all the flotilla ports around the side of it, it meant that your Pi kind of had to be in the project. And, uh, you know, the Pi isn't small. It's, it's not a big thing, but you don't really want to be embedding it right in the middle of a relatively kind of lightweight project. things coming out of every angle anyway. Yeah. So. so we just thought, well, let's just take the dock off the Pi completely. And then at least you just run one cable from your Pi all the way to your project. You have a relatively small dock that's dedicated to doing that thing and and that's why we went down that route we might still introduce a hat style thing for that it might be yeah. cheaper even i don't know yeah four port five port or something like that that goes on top of the pie just if people need that if they want to have an a plus on a robot or something with a with a hmm. battery yeah so they can just kind of completely decouple the pie but at the moment with the usb tether you can run a little tethered robot from the pie quite happily on the desktop which is great for people starting out 
Yeah. Um, you don't want to be messing with kind of batteries and getting that all sorted out and recharging batteries when you're when you're trying to learn electronics. So the tethered approach away from the Pi made sense to us. Um, yeah, so that's why we went that way. Yeah. yeah, which I think was the right choice. When will the next hat be out? Mm. Asked Sandy. Ooh. Cool. I don't even know what we're working on at the moment. What are we working yeah. on? Yeah. Oh, you, you can you can talk about the the follow on to piano hat. Yeah, right? I suppose we could talk that's about right. drum hat. Basically, after piano hat was launched, the obvious follow on, of course, with our uh, affinity for cap touch, was drum hat. And about three or four people came to me and said it would be a good idea to do a drum hat. And at that point, I'd already started thinking about drum hat and mm -hmm. drawn some sketches. And yeah, when three or four people come to you and say it'd be a good idea to do X Y Z, then you kind of do it. So, yeah, this yeah, is the internet. Yeah, if <laughs> lots of people have ideas all the time, and if they start mentioning it a lot, then it's time for the idea to be reality. Definitely. Really. So and a... um, I mean, drum hat isn't the start of something. You'll you'll know we're really phoning it in when we release like the ukulele hat or something. <laughs> you can actually know that's already been mentioned a couple oh, of times. Right. Yeah. No, we might do yeah. that. Okay. There won't I be a hat. Didn't say that. Tambourine hat. Won't be a hat. <laughs> won't be a hat because it'll have the fret coming off the side. Oh, is that the is that the ukulele? I thought it was the guitar. It's one. the guitar hat, but. Yeah. You know, what's a, what's a ukulele? What, well, we're two friends, yeah. Small, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Small okay. guitar. I think on that, on that bomb, no, I can't say that. On that, on that finishing statement, um, we yeah. will call it a day. So thank you very much for uh, joining us in the bilge tank again. And right. we'll see you next week. Okay. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. Well, nailed it. <laughs> goodbye, Paul. See you later, guys. <laughs>